everyone, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on understanding the impact of trauma and developing teen pregnancy prevention programs for tribal youth. My name is Gwendolyn Packard. I'm a member of the Hunkdawan Dakota tribe from South Dakota. I'm a survivor and an advocate for women and children and a program specialist with the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, the National Indian Resource Center dedicated to reclaiming the sovereignty of Indian nations by restoring safety for Indian women and children. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Carol Warshaw and I'm the director of the National Center on Domestic Violence, Trauma and Mental Health. We're a special issue resource center that's supported by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration on Children, Youth and Families, Family Violence Prevention and Services Program. And we're, we're um, our center is designed to improve a program and system capacity to serve domestic violence survivors and their children who are experiencing a range of trauma, mental health and substance abuse related needs and to develop culturally relevant responses to the range of issues survivors face in trying to free their lives of violence and heal from its traumatic effects. Um, we work in the areas of policy, research, training, and capacity building in TA, and also um, public awareness. Um, one of the, the things that, that's been really important to our, to our work and to our partnership with Gwen and the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center is looking at both the individual um, and family aspects that of, of abuse and violence across the lifespan, as well as the social, cultural, and political aspects that um, perpetuate violence and abuse and oppression, and how to think about those issues together in ways that help us um, transform those conditions and their long-standing long effects. So, um, as was mentioned earlier, all questions will be responded to either during the presentation or following it, and you will we'll also have our contact information at the end of the uh, webinar that um, if uh, something comes up that, uh, that, we, with, that you heard today and you'd like to know more about or pursue further, please feel free to contact either Carol Warshaw or, or myself. Um, the objectives for today's webinar are to uh, define trauma, including historical trauma, uh, provide an overview of the biological responses to stress and trauma, uh, to recognize how trauma, including um, trauma from teen dating violence, presents itself in tribal communities, to understand the effects of trauma on individuals' ability to absorb prevention messaging, and to describe trauma-informed services and discuss how to create a trauma-informed environment. So before we get started, um, one of the key elements of doing trauma-informed work that we'll be talking with you about today and that many of you um, I'm sure do already is the recognition of the pervasiveness and impact of trauma in all of our lives, um, which includes all of us as well as the youth that we serve in our programs. And we know that talking about trauma and interpersonal violence um, can evoke painful memories and feelings so we listen to the people that we're working with and to each other and open our hearts. Um, one of the key components of trauma informed practice is for everyone to actively engage in self-reflection and self-care. And trauma-informed organizations place a high value on self-care for staff and for the people that they serve, beginning um, with you. Um, so, Part of that, what that means in organizations and trainings is to ensure that the structural supports are in place for that to happen. So part of what we want to ask you to do is to take a moment to think about what happens when um, painful feelings come up for you and what kinds of things you do to um, restore a sense of balance to yourself or to um, find your right distance and protect yourself from that. So what could you do during this webinar if that happens? Sometimes when we're engaged in our professional roles, um, we're more protected and when we're just actually listening to people talk and reflecting, things come in on different channels and may affect us differently. So we know that working with people who have trauma histories puts us at risk for experiencing vicarious trauma, which is also known as secondary trauma, where when we actually open our hearts and minds um, to bear witness and walk with people, um, we are affected as well. And we'll talk more about how that actually works neurophysiologically in a little while. And we also can experience compassion fatigue, which makes it very hard to continue to feel empathy for other people because um, we end up shutting down to protect ourselves. 
We also know that some of the material that we may talk about can be triggering and that it's normal to have strong feelings when we're listening to stories of traumatic events um, and that we need to find ways to both protect ourselves but make sure we don't do it at the expense of the people that we're working with and at the expense of ourselves and the people in our lives. So just take a moment to think about that and also maybe think about how you do that in your own programs and trainings and outreach activities. Okay, so what do we mean by trauma? Um, individual trauma is the unique individual experience of an event or enduring condition in which the individual experiences a threat to life or to his or her psychic or bodily integrity or to a loved one. The individual's coping capacity and or ability to integrate his or her emotional experience is overwhelmed. We also um, want to identify or define collective trauma, which is the cultural and historical trauma which can impact individuals and communities across generations. And we also want to define um, what we mean by historical trauma for purposes of this webinar, and that is that historical trauma is the cumulative emotional, psychological, and spiritual wounding over the lifespan and across generations emanating from massive group trauma experiences and that the collective traumas of colonization affect nearly 100% of all indigenous peoples in the United States. Within the historical context of um, trauma, we find the following conditions, such as contact or colonization. And here we like to use colonization as an explanation, not a rationalization. Uh, genocide, the policies that were executed early on in, in our history uh, with the U.S. government. And we've seen the effects of that in terms of the violence against women and children. And we know that women and children were the number one casualty of all the um, Indian wars that took place in this country. Um, forced removal, um, locating uh, large uh, groups of Indian people to reservations and to lifestyles that were, were very different from the ones that um, they were familiar with. To go from a hunter and gatherer to becoming a farmer it would be an example of that. Or from going uh, to a, you know, from being a hunter to suddenly becoming a, um, a fisherman and living along the rivers. Uh, so it's very different, a, a complete change in lifestyle and the result of that and the impact on, of that on generations to come. And then I know that we're all familiar with the boarding schools and the, and, and the serious impact that that had on, um, on Indian um, people and, and the breakup of families and um, the removal of children from families and the impact that had on you know, uh, the, the ability of our parents and grandparents and great grandparents to, uh, to parent. Um, we also have the sterilization that took place under the Indian Health Service for a period of about 20 years where um, 30,000 uh, Indian women were uh, sterilized without their knowledge or consent. And of course we have the changing federal policies and we find ourselves as Indian people trapped in a jurisdictional maze of um, uh, especially how it impacts violence against women and the ability for us to, um, you know, have control of our communities and and um, to, you know, help determine the welfare of our people. And, of course, the reservation communities that we find ourselves in, oftentimes they were um, communities, as I'd mentioned earlier, that were totally different from our, our, our way of life. And oftentimes those communities were were very desolate, and um, you know, have it the um, the ordeal we had of changing that lifestyle and living on these in these new new uh, environments, and of course oppression and racism. And oftentimes when um, people talk about Indian people, they they say, well, that was in the past. Um, you all need to get over that. But we know that all of these are still very much with us today as Indian people. They're still very much a part of our reality. But we'll be talking more of these. We've kind of um, interspersed things throughout our uh, presentation today to kind of go back and forth um, with, uh, you know, the, you know the, uh, 
trauma in um, indigenous communities? So part of, um, it, when, when Gwen talked about the definition of trauma, part of what, you know, how we've been, as we've been talking over the last um, year and a half, is looking both at individual trauma and collective trauma and trying to think about how those intersect um, in all of our lives. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift back and talk a little bit about the developmental effects of individual trauma, um, and then we'll come back to thinking about how this um, manifests in Indian country. Um, so first of all, I want to talk a little bit about trauma theory and how important that's been in shifting our understanding of um, mental health, mental illness, substance abuse, all, many of the things that we um, viewed in a very different way. Um, over the past few decades, knowledge about trauma and the, emerge, and the emergence of an empirically supported trauma theory led to a, a significant shift in the ways that mental health symptoms are understood. Um, it's helped to clarify the role that abuse and violence play in the development of psychological distress. So things that we used to think of as purely biological in origin, we now understand really are a result from an interaction of our early life experiences and our biology. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. One of the things that's been so important is that trauma theory recognizes the role of external events in generating symptoms and asks whether and how symptoms may reflect coping mechanisms or survival strategies, adaptations to dangerous or frightening events or situations when other options aren't available. So that's what we talked about as part of the definition. In other words, um, and many of you will have heard this, and it's part of how SAMHSA is beginning to talk in its new definition of, of trauma and trauma-informed services. It focuses on what happened to you rather than on what's wrong with you, and focuses on resilience and strength as well as psychological harm. Um, it also, so it's really reframing things that have been seen as um, uh, stigmatizing as making sense in the context of what happens to us in our lives. Um, and a trauma framework also fosters an awareness of the impact of trauma, including secondary trauma, on, on, all, on providers and really emphasizes the importance of organizational support and provider self-care. And again, it's looking at we're part of the equation. Um, we often talk about how, at least with interpersonal abuse and violence, the, the harm occurs in a relationship and the healing and um, restitution occurs through relationships as well, and, and that the quality of our interactions and relationships is critical. Um, so we also want to talk about um, how understanding the impact of trauma is critical to understanding what helps prevent it and what helps counteract its effects. So as I'm talking about the effects of trauma, um, I want you to think about when we talk about what it means to create trauma-informed services or trauma-focused um, interventions, that all of what we're talking about stems from understanding the effects of trauma and what we can do to counteract those effects in, in our work, in our interactions, and in our work in our communities. It's also important to understand how our early environment, especially our early relationships with caregivers, affects our development and how those interactions are critical in influencing who and how we are throughout our lives. So um, why is a developmental framework so important? Some of this stems, stems from early work on child attachment and development, and some of it from the new neuroscience research that's really shown how we can actually see <laughs> through some of the fancy brain scans how this actually works. Um, so what's important for us to know? Our, our brains grow in relationship to our experience, and the nature and quality of those experiences help to shape our development. Um, and particularly our relationship to early caregivers. So that neglect, stress, and trauma, particularly at the hands of the people who should be helping us, um, in affects our development. But strong early attachments as well as our subsequent caring relationships, and they don't have to be from our families, they can be from our extended families and community, and other resilience factors as well as our own internal capacities can counteract these effects. This, I, um, let me go back for a minute. As our brains develop, they require stimulation, and they adapt to experience. There's a term called plasticity, which is about how our brains continue to grow and reshape themselves in relationship to, um, to our experiences. Um, and that there are, there are critical and sensitive periods of brain development when change occurs the most rapidly when we're, when we're very little. 
um, and when the impact from experience is greater. Um, and during that time, there's a rapid expansion of our brains and the connections between them, um, and that's why early life experiences are so critical. But we also know that throughout life, all of our experiences can affect us and affect our, our, our growth and development. Every time we learn something new, we're actually creating new pathways and new circuits in our brain. So this slide I, um, is important because it reflects one neuron, one nerve cell in our brain. Um, we actually have billions when we're born of, of these nerve cells. And during the first five years of life, they create trillions of connections. So just take a minute and think about how many connections we, we have and we're forming in our brains. Um, when you look at this one cell, and it's nice on a webinar because you can actually see the little dots, which don't always show up in a, in a conference um, room. Each dot is a connection from this one nerve cell to other nerve cells. So just think about that. Um, and it's really our experience that shapes how those can grow um, and develop. So one way to think about that is, um, as I said, when we're born, we have about 200 billion brain cells or neurons. And the trillions of connections between them are what are necessary to make things work, um, particularly in our areas of higher brain functioning, such as thinking and planning, reflecting, our creativity, our empathy that require us to connect up lots of memories and feelings and capacities and have them work together. So when we're born, those aren't very well formed. Um, so part of how our connections develop is through a variety of types of stimulation, including, as I said before, interactions with caregivers, visual stimulation, hearing, sounds, language, and starting to explore our world. Um, so like during a critical period, if, if, you, if your vision isn't stimulated, the part of your brain that processes visual information might not develop. Or if you don't hear language um, during that critical period, you may not develop the, the ability um, to, form, to form language and communicate. Um, so the ability of our brains to continually grow and change it, by building these new connections and letting others die off, which is called pruning. So if we didn't have the capacity to let some of them go, we would just be flooded with sensory information and not be able to make choices and decisions and actually function in our lives. So it's critical to the process of fine-tuning our capacities. Um, so, and while different areas of our brains are, are responsible for different functions, for our motor coordination, for recognizing emotions, for storing memories, for laying down new memories, for critical thinking, all the things we talked about. Um, they all have to be coordinated, and that's why those connections are so important. So part of what we know is that babies who get lots of love and attention actually learn better, and that's partly because brain development depends on the way the brain is used and the extent to which it's used. So every experience we have excites certain pathways in our brain and leaves others inactive. And the ones that are consistently excited um, by experience are strengthened, while others that aren't stimulated kind of fade out. Um, so it's a combination of, of our genes, our, uh, what we're born with, and nurture our experience that interact at every step of brain development. So basically, genes provide our basic wiring plan. Um, but experience really helps to fine-tune the architecture of the brain and determines which circuits will be kept and which won't. And what we now know, there's a, a whole field of um, neuroscience called epigenetics that we're learning that it's the experience that um, creates chemical changes that actually turn genes on or off and determine um, it's not just that we're born with a gene that's going to do a certain thing, but our experience determines whether those genes are activated or not. And each gene actually, um, what the gene does is create a protein which creates a neural pathway. So it's a very, each one is a tiny step in a process of um, making us who we are. Um, so one of the things, the other critical things is understanding the importance. So there's the physiological effects and the importance of those early relationships that also not only wire our brains, but part of what they wire our brains for is how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about other people, and how we feel about the world. It's a, a model for our future relationships and for our ability to trust other people. Um, so our earliest interactions with our caregivers, including love and care and nurture, and consistently getting our needs met begins in utero. When we cry, when we're hungry, when we come to expect um, that people will respond to us, we learn that um, that we're loved and that we're worthy of care. 
um, and our, those relationships with our early caregivers become a model for other relationships. So the other critical piece about that um, early development and attachment is a really important source for our developing our own capacity for resilience and our ability to manage stress. And those protective factors that we develop early on really help us throughout our lives. It also helps us develop a, a, a template. You think about the wiring of our brains for developing our capacity to understand and manage feelings and to develop some of those integrative capacities that we talked about, to be able to think and feel and connect to other people, to understand what they're feeling, um, and that those are active throughout life. If one of our caregivers isn't able to provide that, we have many other opportunities for developing those capacities. Part of how we learn that is through what we call um, uh, there's mirror neurons. Actually, our capacity for empathy and attunement are hardwired. And as um, children, we learn by watching and imitating and matching. We sort of resonate with the people. So if we're in distress and we, we cry as a baby and we can't, we don't have those systems in our um, developed in ourselves, when a caregiver responds to us, we match up with what they're doing and then we develop them in, internally so that eventually we can do that on our own. Let me go to the next slide. So what happens when that doesn't work well? Um, one of the things, uh, um, one of the ways we think about this is normal stress, traumatic stress, and complex developmental trauma when, when um, trauma occurs early on in our childhood and affects all of those capacities as they're developing. Another way to think about this comes from the work of um, Daniel Shankoff at Harvard um, at the Center for the Developing Child. And he talks about this as positive stress, which refers to the types of stress that are part of everyday life, like meeting new people or dealing with frustration. When it's experienced within the safety of a warm, nurturing relationship, when adults help us manage our feelings, it keeps the physiologic stress response manageable and helps us to develop our own um, capacity to manage stress or, and a sense of mastery and self-control. So it's an important part of our healthy development. He also talks about tolerable stress, which are events that could trigger our physiological responses that can disrupt, that are large enough that, to potentially disrupt our brain architecture, like being hospitalized or the de death of a family pet, but are relieved by supporting relationships. And what makes them tolerable rather than harmful is the presence of a trusted or supportive adult or adults who, whose actions can protect us by reducing our sense of being overwhelmed. Um, and it helps us literally turn down our stress response system um, so that it doesn't overwhelm our capacity, um, which is part of the definition of trauma. And then he talks about toxic stress, which is when there's a, a, a strong, prolonged activation of the body's stress response system in the absence of the buffering protection of adult support. And that's where we see the longstanding effects of, of abuse, violence, and trauma. So let's look at this more closely. There's, I don't know if you've heard of this uh, Yerkes-Dotson curve. It's, it's about again, kind of tolerable stress and intolerable stress. And I think we know a certain amount of anxiety and stress may help us mobilize and perform, and that when it's too much, it actually gets in the way and distracts us and keeps us from functioning. So normal stress, as I said, is necessary for growth and survival. Um, and I'm going to skip to the next slide, but this you'll have is the kind of verbal description of what I'm going to show you graphically. Um, what happens is, we developed our stress response system to protect us from danger and threat. It's hardwired in. Um, animals have it as well. And I think you've heard of the fight, flight, or freeze response. So what happens is we perceive a threat, and it, it, it's relayed to our, our senses, to our eyes, ears, nose, um, sense of touch, and to a, what we call a sensory relay station in our brain, which is called the thalamus. And that sends out messages, the really rapid response to our, what we, our alarm system that allows us to mobilize a whole cascade of chemicals that allows us to um, either to fight back or to flee. And that there are slower response systems that then allow us to kind of, kind of take a step back and say, OK, this is squiggly green thing that I'm having this uh, uh, stress response to uh, a garden hose or is it a snake? And then there's an actually slower response that goes up to the um, higher cortical functions at the top of our brain that allows us to think and evaluate and match us up to our memory and decide, do we really need to be upset now or is this really not a threat? So let's look at this in a, as a diagram, which helps us 
see this more clearly. It's a very simplified version of what happens. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because um, this piece of our um, response to trauma has the most robust research behind it. And it helps us make sense of some of the responses that we may have and that the youth that we're serving may have that we find distressing and that they find distressing. Um, and when we understand it, it really helps make sense of that um, and helps us respond more effectively. So a threat comes in to our thalamus or our sensory relay station, and we had this rapid response that um, the amygdala is a part of the brain that is involved with fear processing um, and that sends out the cascades of uh, adrenaline response and cortisol response that uh, mobilizes our ability to respond to threats. This is the next level slower response, the hippocampus, which is, um, which is does pattern matching and recognition and memory so that we can say, okay, this is something we've seen before and we don't have to be afraid, or this is something that we have to worry about. And then the slower response to our cortex, the thinking part of our brain. Um, when the stress goes away, we, we come back to baseline, and all of those systems that have been, um, we call it arousal, have been um, activate and come back and we restore a sense of balance, harmony, and calm. So what does stress do? It shifts us away from a sense of emotional balance and predictability and calls on our system to restore that. So that's what we just saw with a normal stress response. When we're traumatic as stress, the prolonged exposure to traumatic experience without anything that helps us restore that sense of calm shifts us away from that sense of safety and predictability and disrupts our system's ability to restore it. So when you think about someone who has post-traumatic stress disorder and they're in a continual state of, of hyperarousal and hypervigilance when they're being flooded with memories and they hear a loud noise and um, feel like that they're being shot at um, or that, that they're reliving the traumatic experience, um, that's what we're talking about when our system can't get back to normal. It responds as if we're continually in danger. So let's look at how that works. So the threat comes in, and the threat can be abuse, violence, coercive control, or ongoing oppression and discrimination. Um, we have that rapid response to a threat, and when it doesn't go away, that response gets strengthened. Um, and the other parts of our brain aren't working as well. We may not develop those pathways as um, effectively, or they may just be offline um, if the stress and trauma happens later in life. So we're reacting as if we're continually under siege. Uh, what happens then is think about a kid who always is going to anticipate threat. Um, and so they go to school, and they're anticipating um, danger, so they respond with aggression and hostility, and then they get in trouble, and then they end up on a completely different developmental trajectory. Another thing that can happen, the freeze response is dissociation, which is when we kind of vacate the premises psychically when we can't do it, physiolog when we can't do it physically. Um, we all dissociate in different ways when we're driving down the highway, and we notice we've lost track of time. So that's a normal response that we have. But when, it again, that's turned on, um, permanently, it interferes with our ability to function. So we may dissociate um, when something is a reminder of something but isn't really this. Or we may dissociate in ways that um, allow us not to be present. Um, it's a protective mechanism, but it also keeps us from paying attention to our surroundings and noticing things that might be dangerous to us. Um, so what happens is instead of those fear pathways being activated, it's actually the pathways that calm down the fear pathways are overactivated and dampen that response to the extent that we're not able to engage or be present. So if someone is dissociating um, as a kid, they may go to school and not be able to be present and not be able to absorb information or take it in, and that may also put them down a different pathway. Again, thinking about kids who are in your programs who are either overreactive to potential threats or who are um, dissociating and not able to engage and process information, that's going to affect their ability to use the services that you're providing. Um, this slide from Nikki Miller just gives us a sense that there's a whole continuum of ways we can be affected from the hyperarousal to the numbing, from the disengaging or to be you know, intensely focused on potential threats, from having a heightened sense of awareness or just being dulled and shut down, or from having feelings that are overwhelming 
I'm not even being able to know what we're feeling or feel anything. So there's that whole range, and we can move back and forth on that continuum. So again, think about the, the youth that you're seeing in your programs and how they may be affected and how that affects their ability to interact. So I want to finish this section talking about how, how what we do makes a difference. So we're back to that someone experiencing um, traumatic stress. And we look at when we intervene and provide safety or we change the conditions that are producing the trauma in the first place, um, we remove the threat. Oh, let's see. This isn't quite working the way it was supposed to. Let me go back. Um, ah, OK. So it removes the threat, and that fear pathway may diminish somewhat, but it doesn't go away because it's wired in, and it takes a long time to change those neural pathways. Um, when we intervene with medication, it actually literally damps down that um, fear response. And one of the things that's important to know that the, the natural pathways we have, the receptors in our brain that help inhibit and calm down the fear response, the receptors are called GABA receptors. They're the same receptors that drugs like alcohol and benzodiazepines like Valium or Xanax or Ativan bind to. So when our natural pathways um, for inhibiting that fear response don't work, we may select drugs to use that help do that externally. Um, and when we intervene through, through uh, therapy or social support or advocacy or the skills that we help provide in, um, in our programs, it not only helps people to learn how to calm down those responses, it also helps them to build new pathways and strengthen the ones that help us um, be able to think and clear um, and plan and process information. Does that make sense? Um, so it's a lot of factors that are involved, and there are a lot of things that we can do that make a difference. So thinking about how this translates into our experience. So trauma can affect our capacity to trust other people. So psychologically, if when we talked about early attachment relationships or betrayal later on, when trust has been betrayed, it makes it hard to reach out and trust other people. So when we're, um, and it makes it hard for us to turn to other people for help. Or when we are starting to depend on someone um, that we're working with in a program, that may suddenly become dangerous because the people we trusted in the past betrayed us, and then we have to do something to disrupt that. And so when we talk about complex trauma or the, the trauma that comes from early um, experiences of abuse and neglect, one of the things that gets dysregulated besides our uh, ability to manage and um, emotions in our internal affective states is our ability to feel good about ourselves and our ability to engage in relationships that may be helpful, that may be able to comfort us um, and soothe us. We also, it, it disrupts our ability to experience ourselves as deserving and worthwhile. And one of the things that really interferes um, with development is feeling bad about ourselves because of the ways we were treated and what we took in from those experiences. So again, um, when we talk later about how this may lead to higher risk for teen pregnancy, thinking about the kinds of things we can do to help counteract those experiences is critical for our programs. It can also affect our ability to solve problems, mm -hmm. to exercise judgment, and to process mm -hmm. information. And we know that some of those things are challenging for adolescents in the first place, so when you add the experience of trauma that makes that even more complicated. Um, so again, tailoring our intervention um, to, to, to take in the experience of trauma and to do some work with kids in ways that helps them develop some of those capacities that then allow them to make use of what we have to offer. So in sum, our brains develop in relationship to our early experiences. Neglect, stress, and trauma, particularly at the hands of our caregivers, really affect our development. But at, at the same time, there are many, many opportunities to counteract these effects both early on and through the kinds of programs um, that you're providing. I'm going to stop now, and I'm going to switch over to Glenn and think about how this translates for tribal communities. Thank you, Carol. Um, so how trauma presents itself in uh, tribal communities um, earlier on, we, we talked about the context of, uh, of trauma, and uh, now we'll shift to the historical trauma response, which is, um, if you want to go to the next slide, Carol. <coughs> we know that in uh, 
tribal communities on, on based on the data that's available that we have some of the highest um, rates of child abuse and neglect. And um, we also know that uh, what we had mentioned earlier about uh, removal of children from families um, and the boarding schools. And so we see a lot of that in, in, our, in, our, in present day when we look at those high rates of child abuse and, and neglect. Uh, we also have, uh, we also continue to deal with racism in tribal communities and especially in the border towns and the impact that racism has on um, children growing up and, you know, and witnessing it with, uh, with their parents and the treatment they receive uh, when they go to, uh, you know, border towns to buy groceries and, and even within the school system. Uh, another historical trauma response is uh, bloodism. Um, where, you know, half-breeds or full-bloods or you're part this or part that. I think uh, in the United States we're one of the few people that are always having to deal with blood quantum issues and who's Indian and who's not Indian. And, you know, it's, um, I, don't, I, don't, I can't think of another culture in our country that really deals with that to the extent that uh, Indian people have to deal with that. And in our reservation uh, communities, we have um, high rates of uh, bullying and um, lateral violence. And we also experience the high rates of uh, suicide among our young people in, uh, in a lot of our tribal communities. We also have um, high rates of crime and um, antisocial behavior. And some of this was taken from a, a report that was done for SAMHSA on, um, his, on um, trauma in uh, tribal communities. And we have all our um, citations and our um, resources at the end of this presentation for you to go back and review that. And so some of this is the language that was taken from this um, SAMHSA, um, I think it was like a um, focus group or a committee that had gotten together to look at that. Um, we also see the high mental health impacts in our community. We have high rates of depression, high rates of addiction, uh, substance abuse. Uh, we have, um, you know, mental health impacts from our, our children from very, very early ages, um, high rates of depression, and um, very few resources to deal with a lot of this. And so those, um, you know, uh, situations go unchecked and unnoticed for many, many years in, in our children. We have. Um, Physical illness, some of the highest rates of physical illness in our Indian people today. We have a very young population, and we also have a population of, um, you know, like high, the highest rate of uh, the life expectancy for Indian men is like 55 years old. We have some of the, you know, the highest rates of illness and um, mortality rates. We have high rates of sexual abuse. Uh, chronic depression and suicide, uh, disconnection from the education system. Uh, report cards that have been done on uh, schools in Indian country show that there's a high dropout rate, that very few finish high school. Uh, that's not to say that years later they do come back and, and get um, their educations and, and even advanced degrees, but early on uh, we see you know very high dropout rates. Uh, the internalized oppression that we experience in tribal communities sometimes. Um, I know that uh, growing up we used to always hear the story about the, uh, uh, the crawfish and how, you know, we won't let anybody get out of the pot, how we always hold each other down. That was a story I'd heard early on. And um, we experience a lot of those things in tribal communities. And then, of course, there's the high rates of family violence and um, the child abuse, the, um, domestic violence, the um, lateral violence, uh, violence among siblings, uh, elder abuse, all the different types of abuses we see in that context. The next slide was one that was created by um, Maria Brock, who uh, works with uh, Native American uh, Professional Parents Association here in um, Albuquerque. And it's on intergenerational trauma over the lifespan and across generations. And when you look at it, it really, when you look at it, I kind of think of it more as a spiral because it just kind of continues to spiral from experience to adaptive uh, coping responses to uh, 
how that's normalized in the family and used in relationships, how that behavior is carried on throughout our different um, life stages, and how the new next generation comes in and it starts all over again with exposure and observed violence and experience. And we see that continuing to spiral um, across generations and within the context of family and family members. Um, one of the things that um, I've been really impressed with is the adverse childhood experiences um, study that was done years ago. And um, recently we were, a, a bunch of us, we were doing a training and a bunch of us um, took those 10 questions to find out what our ACE score was. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the ACE study, it's, a, it's a 10 questions. I think almost everyone's familiar with it. But some of them are, um, you know, did a parent or other adult in the household in the household swear at you, insult you, put you down, or uh, acted in a way that made you afraid or that you might be physically hurt? Uh, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? Did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or have you touch their body in a sexual way. Uh, there's a series of 10 questions. And so in the, um, the non-Indian ACE study, if you responded to four or, um, four or more of those questions, it puts you into this whole big risk category of becoming an alcoholic or a drug addict when you get older. And, you know, there are a number of risks that came with that with just four or more questions. But when we did it in a group of um, Indian providers and caregivers and healers in our communities, um, most of us were an 8, 9, or a 10 on that score. So when you think about just, just four, the amount of risk that that puts you into, and then when you look at the group that we were working with, you know, we were, we're a very highly traumatized group of people, and yet we're doing this work in our communities. Um, there was a study that was done on, um, with seven Native American tribes, uh, and again, using those 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences, but they included uh, boarding school, foster care, and adoption as cultural variables. And in those, um, they showed 86% experiencing one or more categories of exposure and 33% uh, reporting four or more, which I thought was pretty low for um, tribal communities based on a lot of the experience that I've had in working in tribal communities. And so when I asked um, some of the authors of that study about that, they said they, they agreed. They, they felt that one of, the, um, one of the reasons for that was that they used uh, non-Indian uh, key informants to ask the questions. And they felt that if they had used Indian people to ask the questions of Indian people, they would have gotten a different data set for that. Um, but you know, out of that study, of course, it came, you know, it was, uh, the, the rates of alcohol dependence uh, were significant. And um, the lifetime prevalence of alcohol dependency was high among all those tribes except for one. Um, on the next slide, um, okay, just kind of recap that. <clears throat> um, high rates of, okay, did that one. And then the combined sexual and physical abuse uh, increased alcohol dependence for men. And the combined sexual abuse and boarding school attendance were significant for women. And women with a, a score of uh, four or more had a seven times uh, increase in alcohol dependence. This is another chart that was developed by uh, Dick, uh, D. Bigfoot out of the University of Oklahoma Childhood Trauma Center. And again, it's just another way of, of um, you know, illustrating the impact of uh, most, if not all, of those things that are on the ACE study, such as incarceration, substance abuse, suicide, domestic violence, child abuse, and neglect. But on this one, she puts it in the background of uh, poverty, because that's another 
a thing that the ACE study did not take into consideration is um, poverty. And of course, we know that in tribal communities, we experience high rates of poverty and um, high rates of unemployment. And um, also, we're, uh, we deal with historical events and historical trauma uh, across our tribal communities. We can go to the uh, next slide. So, as I started to mention earlier today, uh, or earlier in the presentation about Indian people, um, there's 4.5 million Indian people in the United States, and we make up about 1.5% of the total U.S. population. But of that number, 1.3 million people are under the age of 18, so we have a very, very young uh, population. And we have less than 336,000 over the age of 65. And we work with a I work at a national resource center, and we often hear that in a lot of tribal communities, they don't have elders, or they have elders that are, you know, uh, in their 40s or late 40s, early 50s, because that's about as, as old as you'll get to be in that um, tribal community. And so we're really losing our, our elderly population at a, at a higher rate than other um, cultures or, or races. And but although Indian women um, live to be um, about seven years, I think we live to be 60, 62 years is our average life expectancy, a little bit more than men, um, that's still a very young age when you compare that to the life expectant, expectancy across races in the uh, national population. And then, of course, uh, over 65% of our people live in off-reservation communities. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about uh, this was um, the roots of violence against Indian women and girls. And as I'd mentioned earlier, I'm an advocate. I'm a survivor and an advocate for women and children. Um, what we know is that woman is um, the heartbeat of our communities. That woman is the foundation of our families. Uh, that wo uh, women are life bearers and life givers, and that uh, women or woman is the first environment. Uh, we all came into this world through a woman. And yet it seems just bizarre that, um, you know, the highest rates of victimization and violence are against women. Native women are two and a half times higher than any other race in the U.S. Uh, victims of sexual assault, and that one in three women will be raped in their lifetime. Uh, Native women are victims of domestic violence at a rate of 64%, and Native women are stalked far greater than any other race in the United States. Uh, Native women um, are murdered 10 times higher than the national average, and that uh, Native women live their lives in the dangerous intersections of uh, gender and race. The, um, in a recent study that just came out from the Centers for Disease Control on interpersonal sexual violence by uh, sexual orientation, the majority of women who uh, reported sexual violence, regardless of their sexual orientation, reported that they were victimized by male perpetrators, and that nearly half of all uh, female bisexual victims, or 48.2%, and more than one-fourth of um, uh, uh, um, women in general, or 28.0% experienced their first rape between the ages of 11 and 17. And I thought that was just, you know, their first rape, that it would even be described that way, because then it seems like maybe, you know, there's, there's more to follow. You know, it's, it's, the, the language is just shocking. And um, so, you know, d data on intimate partner violence and person-to-person -person crimes clearly shows that most violence perpetrated towards women is perpetrated by men. And as I would mentioned previously, it was women and children who were the number one um, casualty of all the um, Indian wars in the United States. We just wanted to mention the um, the... the uh, gender-based violence in the context of this uh, presentation. 
and also to talk just briefly about historical trauma and contemporary pain. And here, I'd just like to ask you to think about um, understanding the impact of historical trauma on tribal youth. And I know that the, the kind of the new term that's merging from all of that is uh, historical trauma by proxy. And that's what a lot of programs that we've heard from experience in working with youth is that you know, the youth are feeling the impacts of the historical trauma and acting out on it without really understanding why, without really understanding what's happening to them and why they're doing the things that they do. And in working with youth, um, a lot of people that we've heard from um, say that it's been really helpful and healing in their communities when they go back and they look at uh, historical trauma and they talk about it and they go back uh, generation by generation uh, 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 against the timeline of discovery in, this, in the United States and look at what the impact of each of these historical things have had uh, on um, uh, different cultural people. And I know it varies from tribe to tribe and from region of the United States to region of the United States since we were all had contact uh, differently and with whether it was the British, the French, or the Spanish, the things were different for all of us. But there's similarities and there's strong lines that run through all of that. And um, you know, when, when, when young people are able to understand that historical context, it helps them understand themselves a whole lot better. So throughout our presentation, we developed some questions that um, we'd like you to think about as um, you do the work in your community uh, with your youth. And so the questions that we have um, regarding historical trauma and youth is, you know, what have you seen in your community? And what has been the impact of historical trauma on your youth? And um, with that, we'll move into trauma and, and teen pregnancy with Carol. Yeah, but if you people want to write in their responses um, to those questions. So, um, so Trying to bring this back to thinking about trauma and teen pregnancy, there's thinking about, we know that youth who are exposed to violence are more likely to become teen parents. And if you're a teen parent, it's, it's likely that you've, um, you're, you're more likely to have experienced abuse and violence. Um, and, and when we think about sexual violence, we think, you know, also think about historical trauma and boarding school experiences. So it's thinking about how all of these are um, it, it intersect and, and how our responses need to be both individual and, co and collective. So in, in some studies, as many as two-thirds of young women who become pregnant as adolescents were sexually and or physically abused at some point as children or in their current relationships or both. And a substantial number of adolescent mothers in violent, abusive, or coercive relationships uh, are in uh, abusive relationships either before, during, or just after pregnancy. We also know that younger women are at greater risk um, for co coercive, um, non-consensual sex. Um, one study uh, found that uh, involuntary sexual activity um, in the experience of 74% of sexually active girls younger than 14 and 60% for girls younger than 15. So there's a, you know, at that age, girls are at, 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 at very high risk for um, coercive sexual um, experiences. So how does this relate to teen pregnancy prevention? Um, you know, many of you, know, I'm sure you all know from your experience um, that this is the case and that you can see, I mean, these slides are meant to just show the research that corroborates that. And why might that be? Um, what have you seen um, in your experience? You can feel free to write in. Um, one is risky coping strategies. So when, when we, part of the, the point of showing those slides earlier about how um, the kind of dysregulation that um, happens within our brain and our physiology from experiencing ongoing traumatic stress, um, that what we don't develop our internal capacity to regulate, we have to use external means to do that. So self-medication with drugs and alcohol is one way to do that, or risky behaviors that are ways to um, try to distract us, ourselves from those feelings or to match up externally what we're feeling internally. Um, um, engaging in early sexual activity as a way to bind feelings or to, to make connections um, are all some of the ways that early trauma can um, play out in increasing our risk for 
for teen pregnancy. Um, we also know that sometimes trauma in the home can lead kids to being what we call premature parentification, where you're forced to behave, act as an adult, um, if, particularly if you're the oldest child or the oldest girl in a family and you're taking care of the other kids. Um, that may lead you to earlier sexual activity as well, um, or a need to get away from your family. Um, at the same time, some teen parents who've had a history of childhood trauma um, experience parenthood and the, the feelings of being able to protect a child as a new source of, of, of hope for themselves and for their children for the future. So that it, getting pregnant, as I'm sure you're well aware and doing the work you do, um, can serve a lot of different functions. Um, there's one other study I wanted to talk about, which was um, by Myland and Mann, um, that a study it was all pregnant and parenting American Indian teen mothers who were primarily as the Northern Plains that were served by an adolescent pregnancy program at an area in the Indian Health Hospital and a tribal women's health program were asked to participate. And it turned out there were only 43 um, of the 186 um, young women who participated. Their average age was about 17 and a half. And you can see that 61% reported intimate partner violence. And for, for almost 40% of those, it was during pregnancy. And over 22% reported current um, coerced sexual activity or forced uh, um, sex um, in those relationships. Um, they also found that almost half, about 42%, had a chemical dependency problem. And there were higher rates of depression. Um, the, a lot of the trauma symptoms of hyperarousal and avoiding feeling bad about themselves and dissociation. So a lot of the things that are the both the traumatic effects of abuse are also things that put kids at greater risk. And one of the things that there's a, another interesting study that paralleled the ACE study, and I just wanted to mention this quickly. One of the things about the ACE study, they used to think one of the things that they found was there was a, a dose response relationship between every category of adverse childhood experience you had and in increased your risk for developing not only problems like substance abuse and depression and a range of mental health problems, but also all the leading health problems like diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease and lung disease. And they used to think it was liver disease because of smoking and alcohol and drug use. But I think what we've come to learn is it's really the effect of early life stress on our neurophysiology. Um, all of those chemicals that pour out to respond to stress end up affecting not only our brain architecture, but also all of the organs in our body. And so again, understanding those effects and developing interventions to help counteract them is critical. So we want to just talk briefly about um, teen dating violence. And um, we begin with the definition of that, which is the ongoing pattern of coercive control in the context of a dating relationship. And I know that a lot of us that are, that are older, <laughs> um, it, it's a whole new world out there in working with young people. And uh, we hear from a lot of communities that, you know, they don't even use the word teen dating violence. <laughs> That's really old school. And so, you know, and then if you want to use the language that the young people use, then they kind of think you're trying to act young and stuff. So I don't know what the answer to that is, but I just wanted to uh, ask you to think about the language that you use in the programs that you, in, in working with the youth. Um, so dating violence is an ongoing pattern of coercive control in the context of a dating relationship. And it may include physical, sexual, or psychological abuse or electronic aggression or economic coercion. Um, it may include sexual or reproductive coercion, mental health coercion, or substance abuse coercion. And it may include all of those. So one of the questions that we have um, for you, again, is based on your experience, and we got, we got a pretty good response from that last set of questions, is um, based on your uh, experience. Are there other dimensions you would add to this definition in the work that you're doing in your communities? And again, please feel free to type in your responses, or if it's something that you want to, this is something you want to think about as you go forward in your work. You want to add to that, Carol? Um, no, I think I want. I realize I'm looking at the time, and I want to make sure we get to some of the interventions. So I'm thinking about maybe we should move a little more quickly through some of the next couple of slides and get to 
what we mean by trauma-informed and, and culturally responsive. Okay. Uh, so this, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do now is a kind of meta talk through what's on these slides. 